So first of all, good morning. I'm going to talk about uh, four topics, more or less. The first topic is uh, about the national question and the Marxism. The second question is a little bit um, the history of the Catalan struggle uh, for independence. The third topic is about the Catalan movement today and the paper or the role of the left, of the Spanish left uh, in, at the moment. And the last topic is about the challenges of the Catalan independence movement. So about the national question and the Marxism, uh, Marx and Engels uh, were saying that the, um, the national oppression is about uh, the prohibition to decide the future of a nation for itself. Uh, so as a, re a revolutionary party or a revolutionaries, uh, we have always to fight for the self-determination right. But it doesn't mean that we always have to support the, the independence movement. One thing is that we always have to support the self-determination right, but we can make a campaign to vote no. So when we should uh, support or not the, an independence movement? It depends if it's going to, to help to develop the class struggle or not. So for example, uh, during the civil war, the revolutionaries in, in Catalonia, they weren't supporting the independence movement. They were supporting the self-determination movement, but they weren't supporting the independence movement. So this is the first in, important key. The second one is that Lenin uh, was uh, telling that there are two uh, um, strategical lines for the working class. One is the, um, the line of the working class in the oppressed nation. Uh, we, as the working class in the oppressed nation, for example in Catalonia, we have to defend uh, the, um, the working class of all the world. Like, uh, um, like saying that the working class has no borders. So we have to be solid, um, to build bridges of solidarity between the Catalan working class and the Spanish working class. And then the working class from the oppression nation, in this case from Spain, must support the independence movement or the self-determination <coughs> movement. So there are two lines that Lenin was saying that how we should understand this type of movement. And third, uh, to finish this part, uh, we have to understand that uh, in all the uh, independence movement or the, or the self-determination movement, the working class uh, must be organized as a class, needs uh, to have their own political program, their own organizations. Why? Because the bourgeoisie, it's going to to be a threat during the movement because all the independence movement are going to to crush regimes so for example we can see in catalonia how this the independence movement was crushing and hitting the the spanish regime so the bourgeoisie also the catalan bourgeoisie is going to be a threat of that so the, the, it's really important that the working class uh, had their own have their own uh, political strategy. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the second topic, the history of the Catalan movement. All the independence movement um, have their own roads uh, in a crash between the local bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie linked by the state. So in the case of Spain, the Spanish bourgeoisie uh, was really wasn't uh, strong enough to to consolidate this idea of a state nation. So in Spain, you can see how there are a lot of national movements in the Basque Country, in the Catalan 
country in in the south also Galicia. So uh, the, the Spanish bourgeoisie uh, couldn't consolidate this uh, state nation. So there are a lot of uh, local bourgeoisie, national bourgeoisies. So in the 19th century, when the um, Spanish state lost the colonies of Cuba and Filipinas, uh, the Catalan bourgeoisie started uh, their own uh, commercial plans with these colonies. So this was one of the roots of the independence movement. And also there's another uh, root that is um, that in the 19th century, a cultural movement called uh, La Renascenza started to grow up in Catalonia. Why? Because the Catalan culture was like uh, the, a culture of the poor people. So they started a cultural movement to put in the middle of the cultural, uh, well, to put in the middle of the culture, the Catalan language and the, um, and the cultural expression, the the culture, the Catalan cultural expressions. So then, in the 20th century, we had two dictatorships in the Spanish state. The first dictatorship was Primo de Rivera dictatorship, and the second one was Franco dictatorship. So twice, uh, well, both they wanted to to smash all the Catalan. A culture and all the uh, and also the Catalan language. So, for example, the um, the sister of my father of my grandfather was born burned in the middle of the square of our village because she only could speak Catalan. So the Spanish police was killing all the people who was uh, speaking Catalan. Uh, defending the right of the national of the national culture, so this was uh, maybe the third road, the third reason of the of the Catalan movement. After the constitution, after the um, 1979, when the dictatorship, the Franco dictatorship, was finished. Um, there wasn't an uh, independence movement, but there was a uh, national movement asking for national rights. For example, to have uh, our own educational plan, our own police, our own, well, some national rights to decide for ourselves something. So now I'm going to talk about the the Catalan movement today. During the economical crisis, the Catalan government was asking to the Spanish state about some uh, national and social rights because the Catalan people was, was, pun uh, was pushing the, the Catalan government to do it. So the answer of the Spanish state was always no always in all the topics for example there was uh, there was a lot of demonstrations asking for a new educational system and finally the catalan government approved it but the spanish state say no you cannot approve it so people started to get angry and in 2011 in the National Day of Catalonia, that is the 11th of September, was the first time when uh, 3 million people went to the streets asking for independence. So it was in, uh, two, in 2011, more or less, when this uh, Catalan movement started to talk about the independence and asking for the referendum. Before, it was only about more national rights, more social rights. But after this date, it started to ask about independence. So the, we had a little referendum 
the 9th of November of 2013, but it was like a, it was like a kind of demonstration. It was not a, an official referendum, but uh, finally we had uh, the the real referendum that was the first of October of uh, 2017. So the days before the the referendum, the Spanish state was saying that they wouldn't allow us to do the referendum, and they sent us, uh, I think that two two thousand policemen from our, all around the Spanish state to Catalonia, and what is really funny is that the 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 owners of the hotels they were they were saying we are not going to host the Spanish police mm -hmm. so the Spanish police had to stay in a ship ship yeah mm -hmm. in a sea and the, the ship was a uh, like a ship uh, for children to make tourism mm -hmm. like with toboggans <laughs> and with, like an attraction park and they had to stay there. Also, the the police, uh, the Spanish police, entered to the national movements venues, and they started the repression against the national movement, the independence movement. For example, 20 days before the the referendum, uh, a political party from the south of Spain called me to go to Andalusia to make a speech. And I was in the airport and I had a lot of banners and a lot of stickers of the referendum in my bag because they asked me to bring some material. And when I was in the airport, the Spanish police took my bag and they put it in the, all the, my material in the rubbish. And there were only stickers. So you can see how the repression it is. Mm. It's not only about against the demonstrations, against the, the movement, the action movement. It was in all our lives. I mean, um, for example, I can remember that in the social center of my neighborhood, the police came and they were checking all. And they were taking some banners, so also we had this type of, of repression. But we celebrate, we finally celebrate the referendum and it's not a, a lie and it's not a joke if I say that we celebrate the referendum because the people was self-organized. Uh, without the people, we couldn't celebrate the referendum. For example, do you know how we opened the, the schools in my neighborhood. Maybe half of the schools of the election centers were open because we had the keys, but we didn't have the keys of the half of the election centers. <coughs> so the, we had to occupy the electoral centers on Friday, organizing a lot of activities, saying to the police, no, we are not occupying the school. We are organizing yoga, breakfast, uh, football. Um, yeah, it was this kind of self-organization. And also, for example, I can, I can remember that in my neighborhood there were 12 electoral centers and three of them were closed the night before. So you can imagine I was with my motor motorbike calling to the firefighters and they came at night with hammers, hammers to open the election, uh, electoral centers. So you can imagine that it was only possible because the people was uh, supporting. Yeah, supporting to do it. 
And also, uh, do you know how, how we manage uh, in, my elector, in my electoral center to vote? Because the Spanish police came to took the ballot boxes. Do you know how we managed to do it? I was the responsible of my electoral center and we had six ballot boxes. And I was sure that the police would came. So I said to my comrades, okay, we are only going to use three ballot boxes. I'm going to hide the three others. And they were like, yeah, but this is not completely legal. And I was like, okay, but they are going to come. They are going to hit us. So let's go to do it. So uh, when a friend called me, like, Marina, the Spanish police is coming. I took the ballot boxes, the real ballot boxes, and I hide it and I put the fake one <laughs> with uh, white papers inside. <laughs> so the Spanish police came, we closed the door of the electoral center uh -huh. and they started to break the door with some hammers and finally we sat on the floor like this, saying like for example we want the independence, uh, police go out from our neighborhoods, blah, blah, blah. And they took the fake ballot boxes and the people stand up and they started to, to walk, saying uh, Spanish police go away from our neighborhoods. And they went away and I took the real ballot boxes and we continued uh, voting. <laughs> And this is only one history. In every electoral center, this, there was a history. For example, in a village, the Spanish police was going on the road with the cars, and the people cut one tree here and another here, and they were, they cannot move the car anymore. So, or another example is that uh, the people was voting and they, uh, someone called them, hey, the, the Spanish police is coming and they hit the ballot boxes and a lot of old people came and they started to play domino. <laughs> and when the Spanish police enter like this to the, to the electoral center, they only could find the grandfathers and the grandmothers playing dominoes. <laughs> so people managed to do it. And yeah, it was, it was amazing. No, really. It was amazing because it was a big example of self-organization. But also we have to say that it was maybe it was the day where I was more afraid in my life. You can see the, the pictures, the videos about the police against our people. And it was really hard because it was not like a demonstration where you go and you know that maybe something can happen. There was a lot of old people. There, I, I can remember my grandmother sitting in a chair like this on the, on the door of the lectural center and the Spanish police came, so it was, I was really afraid. Um, so during the, the days before the referendum and during the 1st of October, we create uh, popular assemblies that, uh, were, that were called uh, CDRs, Committees in Defense of the Republic, in every neighborhood. Uh, in 20 of October, we had f more than 400 CDRs around Catalonia. Every neighborhood had their own assembly. Every village had their own assembly. And these committees uh, had organized a lot of demonstrations. So there wasn't 
uh, a political party who were organizing the demonstrations. There wasn't a big organization. It was the people in the neighborhood talking, discussing what we should do. For example, when the, um, when the king of Spain came to Barcelona to have an important dinner, in my city air, we decide to rent a flat in front of the restaurant and we rent a big stereo and we put really loud the, the, Repub the Spanish Republic anthem. And you can see in the TV the face of the king like this, like what's happening? So this is an example of all the actions, all the demonstrations. And for example, we were uh, saying that we were say it was really funny. We were saying all the power to the city heirs. And one day we enter inside the, the garden of the parliament. We broke the, the door and thousands of people enter inside saying to the Catalan government, we should, uh, you should uh, apply the independence you should apply the result of the referendum. So in October, November and December, the focus was completely in the street. We had maybe three demonstrations every week and it, there, it was like big mo movement. It was not a demonstration about 5,000 people. No, it was really big movement. But at the 1st of December, uh, so three months after the referendum, the things changed. Why? Because the Spanish state forced us to call for elections and the Catalan political parties accepted. So if, the, if after the referendum the focus was on the street, after the 20th uh, of December, the focus returned to the institution. So the, the movement started to decrease and the, the CDRs started to die because there wasn't any uh, answer to the movement from the political parties and from the political organizations. So after this summer, the, we can say that the CDRs doesn't exist anymore. In my neighborhood, it keeps working, but it's not the same. It's not the same. It was like uh, if after the referendum we were 300 people in my CDR, now we are 50 people, we are working, but it's not the same. It's not the same level of, uh, of the movement. So now I'm going to, to talk about the third topic, that is the um, Catalan political uh, actors and the Spanish left. In Catalonia now we have three political positions. One is the neoliberalism, the party of Puigdemont, uh, it, they represent the big and the middle Catalan bourgeoisie. They seem that they are really radicalized, 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 yeah, radicalized. But they are completely afraid of the movement. They are completely afraid. Uh, why? Because the Catalan movement, the independence movement, is not only asking about the independence, is also asking about social rights. So they are completely afraid about general strikes, about the relation between the social movement, the, the working class movement and the independence movement. Then we have the Catalan social democracy. Uh, now they are asking to make a refer, uh, a refer official referendum, so they are asking 
to the to the Spanish state, to the Spanish uh, government, to have a new referendum, which is impossible. How can you ask to the Spanish government a referendum after what happened in the first of October? So now they they are saying, yeah, but we need to be more. Uh, the 50% of um, support uh, of people supporting the independence is not enough. We need to have the 70, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's true. We need to be more, of course. But they are using this like an excuse because they are not working to be more. And then we have the anti-capital list left called CUP. CUP is like an electoral coalition and there are a lot of anti-capitalist group inside so they cannot manage to, <laughs> to elaborate a political program. I mean, if you say, okay, we need to build the movement in the street, all of them agree, but how to build? And then they start to discuss and anything more. So they are in the correct position, but they are not giving any concrete answer to the movement. And this is a really big problem. Then in the Spanish left, we have Podemos. Podemos is not uh, supporting the, okay. They are not supporting the independence movement, yes. but they are not supporting the self-determination movement neither. So this is a problem because they are only supporting the Catalan movement uh, when we are talking against the repression. So if we ask about to, to have a referendum, they are not supporting us. For example, they say that the referendum of the 1st of October, the, it wasn't a referendum, that it was a demonstration. Come on, <laughs> how can you say that? And then we have the anti-capitalist <coughs> Spanish left. Uh, it's not really big, it's not really big, so this is a problem, but we had a big connection between CDRs, the committees in defense of the Republic and the, and the anti-capitalist Spanish left. For example, the 1st of May, they invite us to talk uh, uh, about the, the independence movement in the, in the demonstration. We had organized a lot of meetings together, but they are not really big, so this is a problem. So the biggest demonstrations uh, in, Cata in, in Spain supporting Catalonia were only uh, about uh, against the repression and were organized uh, with Podemos and then the anti-capitalist left. So now to finish, um, now to, to finish I will talk about the, the challenges on the independence movement. First of all, I have to say that the Spanish state uh, has used uh, the same strategy that they used in the Basque country. And is a type of repression that it's like two ways of repression. The first way is to attack the representative people. In, this, in the case of Catalonia, the political prisoners. Uh, we have 12 political prisoners, and we have Puigdemont in Belgium, Anna Gabriel, that is a member of CUP in Switzerland. So this is a type of repression. But then we have another type of repression, that is the logic that everyone in Catalonia can suffer the repression. Why? Because, uh, for example, uh, the CDRs had a coordination, a national coordination. I was the, I was the 
the representant of the Barcelona of Barcelona coordination in the national coordination and the girl from another territory inside of Catalonia uh, was in her house and one day at night at night uh, the Spanish police uh, went to her house they started to to try to find something they they found uh, like a book of of a Catalan politician they found uh, some scissors they found uh, some materials to the demonstrations and they said that she's a terrorist so they took her they picked uh, her to Madrid one week she was one week on the jail only because she had materials to organize a demonstration mm -hmm. and now she ca she cannot go away from his uh, her village for example uh, her mother was ill and her mother was in a hospital in Barcelona and Tamara my friend was calling to the police asking if she would go to the hospital to visit her mother and the Spanish police say no you cannot go away from your village only if you need to work so this is a type of repression because if Tamara has this situation I can have it my neighbor can have it everyone who is participating in the independence movement can can suffer this repression. So people is really afraid. And this is a problem because, for example, I can remember a member of the CDR con coordination that one day called me and she told me, Marina, I cannot be more in the coordination because I have two children and I'm really afraid. So this is also a type of repression. It's not only about the political prisoners. So I um, so one thing, one challenge is how to manage this type of repression, because for example in the Basque Country, after the, the they had a big independence movement and after the repression, uh, they focus all the independence movement only asking uh, for the freedom of the prisoners. So there wasn't. Uh, independence movement and anymore in the past country so one challenge is how to deal with their repression the second challenge is that we need to be more of course we are not going to win only with the 50% of people in Catalonia supporting the independence we need to be more and we need to be more uh, linking the national question and the social movements and the social question because we need to explain to the people to the migrant people to the poor people that uh, independence movement of Catalonia is not only about to change the ID card it's about to change everything to change the laboral rights to change the educational rights the, to change the public health uh, care. So we need to connect all these claims. Third, uh, we need to be organized as working class, having our own uh, political program. Because we, can, uh, we had two general strikes in Catalonia and we have seen how the general strike is the best we weapon to win. And also, we have seen how the bourgeoisie is really afraid when we use this type of weapons, when we use the general strike. So we have to be organized as working class. We have to involve the trade unions in the independence movement to win. And the third uh, challenge, and I will finish here, is that we need to build 
uh, breaches of solidarity with the Spanish working class. And this is really, really important because the Catalan people alone is not going to win. The, the independence movement is hitting the Spanish regime, but we need all the working class from the, from the Spanish state to, uh, to, cra to destroy the Spanish regime together. If not, we are not going to win. Uh, one example is that in Murcia, uh, in the, more or less in the south of, of Spain, uh, they wanted to destroy a neighborhood to build a, like a train, more or less. And uh, they were organizing a big, a big, big, big demonstrations. And we organized a group of people to go there to support them to, to build this type of solidarity. So we need to, to build, as Lenin said, this, this solidarity. And thank you. Mm -hmm.